Friends, let's begin with prayer. Holy One, not one day of our lives is more or less important to you. On this day, you have called us into this place together, moving our hearts and whispering your word of welcome. You plant the music of our souls in us as we seek you. Lead us in your way that we may hear your call and your blessing. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit as we awaken to God's mercy. All around us, God is looking for people who will join in serving others. It is as if God is planting seeds of compassion in us, watching for them to bloom in our lives. In our midst, Jesus is walking among us, tending our hearts, water watering us with grace. It is it's as if Jesus is trusting that our soul will grow big enough to welcome everyone. From morning to evening, the Spirit is at work, gently tending this garden called life. It is as if the Spirit has found the perfect spots to bring forth crops of justice and peace. Oh, I 
Please be seated. We long to live as God's people, yet in the very depths of our lives, we know we have hurt those around us through words and actions, as well as from indifference. But God is with us as we awaken, teaching and reconciling that we may become part of the healing of the world. Let us pray together. You listen to our cries of grief when others kill our dreams. You open our ears to the whispered fears on sleepless nights. You hear our hearts cracking, just like ice on a frozen lake. And we know this is the one, our God, who knows us better than we think. You call to us so we can watch as you place seeds of welcome in the hearts of the rejected, seeds of wonder in the overgrown city lots, seeds of laughter in the dull voices of grief. And as we watch, we learn. And as we learn, we say, this is the one, the grace who is our brother. You are with us as we sleep and when we rise, nurturing tiny seeds of grace into bouquets of love, insignificant hopes of peace into communities of reconciliation, the littlest thoughts about others into an embrace, as big and wide as the sea. And we rejoice the Spirit transforms us. You are indeed the one, God in community, drawing us into your circle of dance, grace, forgiveness, and love.
Amen. The spirit that sets us free from self-deception and illusion when we turn our hearts to God. God offers what we cannot provide for ourselves and loves us, unveiling the abundance of our lives. Friends, believe the good news. Love conquers our fear and heals us. I invite you to share Christ's peace with one another, with one another remembering to save the handshakes and hugs for a future day. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Hi friends, peace be with you. So I have my friend Ainsley here. Can you say hi, Ainsley? Hi, Ainsley. Well, you're Ainsley. Oh, yeah, I know that. There's a lot of people here. Yeah, there are, but you know what? Well. There's even more. Well, where are they? Well, see that camera up there? Yeah. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> so there's people worshiping online, and that means that they're able to join us virtually. So they're in the computer? Well, not really. They're just able to watch us on the computer. Oh. That's cool. It is. So do you know what we're talking about today, Ainsley? God? Well, yes. We are in church. And we do talk about God in church. But do you know more specifically what we're talking about? Jesus? Well, yeah. We're talking about the kingdom of God. Do you know what the kingdom of God is? No, but you're going to tell us. Yes, I'm going to tell you. So in the scripture today from Mark, it talks about the kingdom of God, and it talks about the kingdom of God, but a beehive? No, but kind of, maybe? It's like a mustard bush. Oh, I don't know about those. You do? Why don't you tell us? Okay. So, a mustard bush grows from a really tiny seed. It does, and I have some here. They're so tiny. Yes, they're so tiny. And then, the bush grows so big. And what happens in the bush? Well, birds come and build their nests, and Squirrels come and take shade from the sun. That's right. So the kingdom of God is like that because it's a place where we can go and be safe. That's right. We can all be safe and know that God loves us because God has provided these things for this place for us to go and for shade and for protection. Yeah, that's cool. It is cool. And when we are a part of the kingdom of God, we're like one big family. That's right. We're like one big family. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for seeds that grow into big bushes and trees and beautiful flowers. Thank you for your protection and for safety and for your love. 
In your name we pray, amen. Please pray with me. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find wisdom, and in your will discover your peace. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture reading today is from Ezekiel chapter 17, starting with verse 11. Listen with me for God's word for us today. The Lord God proclaims, I myself will take one of the top branches from the tall cedar. I will pluck a tender shoot from its crown, and I myself will plant it on a very high and lofty mountain. On Israel's mountainous highlands, I will plant it, and it will send out branches and bear fruit. It will grow into a mighty cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it and find shelter in the shade of its boughs. Then all the trees in the countryside will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and raise up the lowly tree and make the green tree wither and the dry tree bloom. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. Holy wisdom, holy word. Good morning, everyone, and peace be with you. My name is Mike Wilson. Um, many of you know me as Dr. McCullough's husband. Uh, I am also a teaching elder here in Middle Tennessee Presbytery, currently with an at-large status, and I have been, uh, over these last months, preaching around uh, Middle Tennessee Presbytery, and I am so happy to... Uh, to be with you all today and to accept Mary Louise's invitation. Today in our New Testament uh, story, we are early in Mark's gospel. Jesus has given his mission statement. He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. He very quickly after that calls his first disciples and then he establishes himself as an exorcist and as a healing miracle worker. Today, in chapter 4, Jesus sets out another part of his ministry. He establishes himself as a teacher of parables. And so chapter 4 is a, is a series of parables, one long one and then an explanation and then a couple of others, and then we get to today's. And Mark tells us, Jesus said, this is what God's kingdom is like. It's as though someone scatters seed on the ground, then sleeps and wakes night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but the farmer doesn't know how. The earth produces crops all by itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the full head of grain. Whenever the crop is ready, the farmer goes out to cut the grain because it's harvest time. Jesus continues. Uh, what's a good image for God's kingdom? What's a, what's a parable I can use to explain it? Consider a mustard seed. When scattered on the ground, it's the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all vegetable plants. It produces such large branches that the birds of the sky are able to nest in its shade. 
With many such parables, Jesus continued to give them the word as much as they were able to hear. He spoke to them only in parables, then explained everything to his disciples when he was alone with them. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mary Louise and I have had to accept that neither of us is really interested in detailed landscaping and gardening. In our current home, we do, you know, the minimum, maybe more, to preserve the work that the previous owners had done, the things that they had planted. I mow the lawn, trim the hedges, pull the ivy. I definitely like to cut things down with a chainsaw. This year, we dropped some annuals around the, the bottom of the mailbox, and we have some potted plants on the deck. That's about it. In our Pittsburgh home, we made some rather haphazard attempts at beautification. There was an odd assortment of flowers, mostly perennials, some shrubs, a tree planted here and there. You know, why not? Most thrived, some failed. Both our front and backyards in our Pittsburgh home were tiny, and I can still tour them in my mind's eye. There was this one prickly, low thing that I, that I stuck in, the, in a corner of the, the backyard by the basement doors. I had hoped that it would become ground cover and kind of take over this, this flower bed. Um, but after three or four summers, it stubbornly refused to expand and just as stubbornly refused to die. It would just kind of shake its prickly little fist at me, you know, and dare me to, to mow it over or plant it somewhere else. But I would give it no such satisfaction. One of our greatest accomplishments was a wonderful fast-growing cedar that we planted a couple of years before we left, a dozen or so years now, and shortly after, our next-door neighbor cut down this, this magnificent, tall, 40-foot pine tree that was nonetheless threatening to fall over on his house. That pine tree had blocked our view of, a, of an ugly streetlight, and it made our backyard cozier. So this cedar that we planted, it was shorter than me when I dropped it into the hole. A couple years later, right before we left, it was, it was at least 20 feet high and already blocking that street light. Not as mighty as Ezekiel's cedar, but impressive nonetheless. My favorite plant of all was one that we miss dearly and we still talk about it. It's this bush that Mary Louise stuck next to the deck, I think in our second summer. I do not know what it is called, and those of you who are gardeners, you know, you may be able to run down a list of potential species. Do not do that, because I will not be able to say, oh yeah, that was it. It is an amazing bush, though. It has these intensely bright green leaves that, that kind of have a neon glow that seems to come from, from inside the leaf. And when you look close, the leaves aren't just one or two or, or three greens. They're, they're dozens of greens, scores of greens, all the greens. And then in September or October, they start to change color from green to red, lots of reds. Ruby and, and garnet, burgundy, vermilion, fire engine, barn. And not until the leaves actually start falling from the branches would you think that they are dying because they remain firm and full, their edges straight, right to the very end. And when all the leaves are gone, the framework of slender branches is beautiful all by itself. We cut them back, though, all the way to the ground. 
So what was once a plant, you know, three feet tall, maybe five feet wide, became a, a collection of, of two-inch stubs just poking up through the dirt. But just as soon as possible, in March or April, little green and tender shoots would start poking up through the dirt. I do not know how this shrub which we tended almost not at all, decided that we were worthy of its beauty. It poured out its graces in return for very little. Such is the kingdom of God. Some seeds scattered on the ground that grow without our knowing how, the benefits of which we reap without contemplating the miracle. And beyond that, I'm not sure there's much more I want to say, at least about parables, because to say more about a parable is to rob it of its purpose. Jesus told these little stories to spark our imaginations, to open us, for some maybe to force us to struggle with mystery. I'm not sure what these parables are about generally beyond the the kingdom, the kingdom, the reign, the realm of God, the basileia to theu. There seems to be some implication that Jesus himself could explain them more definitively, but Mark is not letting us in on these disciples-only conversations. So we're left wondering, is this about how God's kingdom isn't dependent upon our efforts? Is Jesus urging us to have a farmer's patience Maybe it's about grace. So sure, all of those, certainly more. Perhaps most broadly, Jesus throws these things out to, to keep us guessing, and quite literally throws them out. I mean, the, the word parable means thrown alongside of. So we're not supposed to be able to pin these stories down. Parables don't teach so much as they describe. They don't tell us how to live so much as paint a picture of God's flow and presence that gives life its meaning. And maybe if we are to learn anything, it's that we can't let mystery and surprise and the paradoxical power of God get squeezed from our lives. It's our nature, though, I think, especially in times of tension and anxiety, ambiguity and transition, to seek clarity, to want or even demand policies and procedures and timelines. I have learned from hard experience that churches and church people like to know the plan. They like the order. There's a, a story I like to tell about this man that, that, uh, that I knew in the church that I served in Pittsburgh. His name was Dick Hurl. Dick piloted 51, 51 F-17 heavy bomber missions over Germany in World War II. And he took great pride in the fact that he only got shot down once. Dick was not a trivial man, and certainly someone that I respected and dearly loved. In that church, we experimented with and, and refined a variety of worship styles and formats. So the first Sunday that we deployed a screen and used guitars and drums Dick came into the sanctuary, as he would normally do, about 10 minutes before the start of worship. And then he looked around, and he walked out. And my heart sank. Dick had started to come back to the church after I became the pastor, and I did not want to alienate him. He was gone before I even realized that he had left the building and, and driven away. 
So the next week, you know, we're back to the, to the regular worship format, the organ, choir, no screen, and Mr. Hurl was back. So I quickly started to explain to him that we were only going to be doing that different style of worship occasionally, that we weren't doing any radical changes. But then he told me that his problem was not the guitars or the drums or even the screen. The problem was that there was no printed order of worship. So I replied that, well, everything you need to know will, will just be up on the screen. You can, just, you can just follow along. But that wasn't good enough because he explained that he needed to know what came next. So he couldn't worship without knowing the whole plan, the whole order ahead of time. So, the next time we did that kind of service, I, I put together a really simple printed order of worship. It didn't even have any, any words to the liturgies or titles of the songs. It just said, call to worship, opening songs, prayer of confession, scripture reading, sermon. And that did the trick. And Dick then became so ardent a supporter of that service that he would come early to hear the band and the singers rehearse. Church people like order. They like to know the plan. More recently, I, I worked with a church, tried to get them to participate in this really amazing program through Belmont University's Charlie Curb Center for Faith Leadership. It's an interdenominal effort for urban churches in Nash Nashville. It's funded by the Lilly Foundation. It is meticulously researched on a national scale, developed and led by people whose ex expertise and faith I have grown to to know, trust, and admire over the last six or seven years, people whose wisdom and counsel and training and friendship has sustained me in profound ways in my vocation here in Middle Tennessee, people who would be intimately involved with the participating churches and the pastors as coaches and counselors. It is also a brand new program, never done before. And so for this congregation, it was a hard sell. Despite all of its transformative possibilities, there was no track record. There were no statistics for demonstrable growth, no guarantee that all the kinks would be worked out. It's still in beta and comes with no promises. The potential rewards come with a certain amount of risk, and certainly some parts, efforts, and ideas will certainly fail. So why should we be the ones that they are trying it out on? Maybe we should just wait and see if it works or not. Let others work the kinks out. And remember, you know, we tried, and then the list of all the things that we tried didn't work. What some on the leadership wanted was a proven no-fail plan with defined steps and a timeline along with an opt-out clause if it got too difficult or time-consuming. And almost paradoxically, there was skepticism because the program came with no cost. So if we're not paying anything, how do we know its value? I wonder if Jesus' followers were ever like that. Do you think any of Jesus' listeners ever said, stop talking about farmers and seeds and birds and just tell us what you mean? <laughs> Give us the plan. And sometimes I wonder if Jesus himself ever had any really well-conceived and meticulously thought-out meaning behind these little stories. As Mark tells it, he's just coming up with parables on the spot. You know, like... Uh, what's, a, what's a good image for, for God's kingdom? Uh, you know, what parable can I use to, to explain it? It's like a mustard seed, you know? So he's just wondering out loud here, and I wonder if, if, if the disciples ever nudged each other and whispered like, I, I think he's just making this stuff up. <laughs> These parables that... Even these little ones that Jesus just scatters about like so much seed are not going to be much help if you want to know how to do something, if you want the plan. 
They are indispensable, though, if you want to know why we do what we do. Why we should persist in being the church. Because this, this is, or, or supposed to, is supposed to be God's kingdom. The church is, as we say, the provisional manifestation of the, the kingdom of heaven. We are those who Christ calls to be God's realm, God's reign, God's kingdom in the world. To model as best we can what rich, life-giving soil looks like and can do. What abundance looks like, what provision looks like, what shelter looks like, what grace looks like. These parables are who we are, or should be. And there are no rules on how to get to this kingdom. Jesus tells us what it looks like, not how to build it, or more rightly, to reveal it, to participate in its revelation. We get to, have to, Figure that out, day by day, month by month, year by year, parable by parable, trial by trial, error by error, success by success. And isn't this an exciting time for the church? It's fair to say that we are in as liminal a space as transitional and, and potentially transformative a space as we have ever been in. Our current circumstances, and not just those imposed by the pandemic, but the seismic shifts in religion, spirituality, affiliation, and relevance that were well underway before March of last year, our current circumstances almost demand risk and, and the profligate sowing of seed, all kinds of seed, and maybe with a, a little less worry about tidy rows and perfect soil and almanac schedules, maybe with a little more eagerness and openness to what will be rather than a blind rush to get back to what was. Maybe, as a, as a lovely hymn text goes, letting go of what had seemed sure, and in this odd pilgrim age, trusting God all the more. What a wonderful place to be, this odd pilgrim age. And of course, of course we are not in this odd pilgrim age alone. In fact, the, the Basileia Tutheu, the kingdom of God, will not be revealed by our force of will or by purely human effort, no matter how detailed, vetted, and proven the plan. In the story, the, the, the sower scatters seed, but doesn't even water or weed. God, God is the one who takes the, the small, even meager effort and creates bounty. The tiny mustard seed that sprouts its sturdy branches. But you know, even mustard seeds have their limits. There's a, a nice little bit of clarity in the translation that I, I use today. I use the, the Common English Bible. There's a, a Greek word that Mark uses, it usually gets translated as vegetable plant elsewhere in the New Testament, but is most often rendered as shrub in this one parable. So whoever translated Mark for the CEB decided to stay with vegetable plant to help us see that Mark, or, or Jesus and Mark, was not aiming for something over the top here. Unlike Matthew and Luke, who, apparently troubled by a too-small kingdom metaphor, magically make the mustard seed grow into a huge tree, Mark lets it stay 
a vegetable plant. Just a mustard shrub. Pretty amazing in its own right, to be sure, but, you know, hardly the be-all and end-all of biblical metaphors. Jesus doesn't use a, an amazingly large metaphorical tree to make his point. Just some birds nesting in a shrub is perfectly sufficient to spark our imaginations. One writer on this parable says, it is an image of expansive gentleness, but not of overwhelming, unmissable glory. The, the kingdom of God is described not in grandiose terms, but in terms of ordinary, quiet beauty as an inviting place to call home. Ordinary, quiet beauty, an inviting place to call home. The kingdom of God is an ordinary, quiet beauty, an inviting place to call home. And maybe that's a perfectly fine aspiration for the church as we move into our unknown what's next. An inviting place to call home. A people of ordinary, quiet beauty. An active, living parable. Rich soil. Wide branches. Seed scattered and sown. And if we can get there, God will handle the rest. And we will see all the greens, every red, and the kingdom of God will, will grow and flourish. And with birds, And for that, thanks be to God, and amen.
We come now to the time when we remember our prayer ritual, and we hope to return to that in some way in the future, but because as we return, we're also accustoming, accustoming an online format. This is just not holding up, is it? Should I switch? Are we good? Okay. Because we're getting accustomed to an online format, um, it's not possible for, for reasons of confidentiality uh, to, to name our names and to share these, these names and to pray that way. So we hope to figure something out, and we're on our way to doing that. In the meantime, I wanted to mention a couple of people with their first names because I think many, most of you know who they are. Doris wanted me to say how grateful she is for all the love and for the prayers as she continues recovering from a fall which has also involved serious heart issues. She is back in the nursing facility uh, at the place in, in uh, Brentwood where she lives. So, but she is so aware of all of your care and love. So she wanted me to tell you that. Teresa and Lawrence are having a rough time again, and so if you would keep them in your prayers. And also, uh, Anne is recovering from a, uh, a knee replacement surgery. I'm sure you have yours, your prayers. So I invite you to take one of the prayer cards that are in the pews, and please uh, put it in the offering bag, this beautiful offering bag at the back of our, of our sanctuary before you leave. And we will pass those to the prayer chain as well as the staff. We'll let no one know and we'll all be in prayer for you and for your concerns. Friends, let's continue our prayers together. The Lord be with you. Holy One, our needs are many, and sometimes it seems our voices are few. In the frantic pace of our lives, we slide from gratitude to indifference, to neediness in the blink of an eye, forgetting the miracles that do surround us every day. Waking up, the miracle of embracing a beloved person or pet, delighting in a meal with friends, watching the sun rise or set, the flowers glistening through drops shining after a rain. Our pleasures flow forth, and you, our maker, our guide, you never tire of providing this abundance to your earth, to us. Thank you for the seeds of life, of healing and reconciliation, which you throw everywhere with utter abandon open our eyes to notice. We ask that you will give us new courage for this time, courage to move through the chaos and intuit what is true, see through what is false, work for what will matter in addressing the suffering, the trauma that our own systems, our ways of life have created. Courage to start our days with you so that we stay grounded in spite of what comes, Courage to remember and return to you, our divine source, instead of sliding into our places of fear and insecurity, our gardens of compulsive behavior. Courage to find ways to refresh ourselves and not revert to the falsehood that we must save the world. You have saved us, Holy One. You sent us with directions that are so simple we forget them. You are with us, always, teaching us to love. Help us to walk the simple way of Jesus without fear and to hear his command to love one another as we love ourselves. Transform the systems that lie and seek to smother your spirit, the structures dressed up as tall trees. May we, like Ezekiel, recognize and believe that you make the dry tree bloom, and you invite us to join you in that transformative work. It is your spirit that comforts the afflicted through us. It is your ways that afflict the comfortable. So may we never choose comfort, 
when it is ours to speak, act, and live your way of difference. Show us where to pour our energy that we may feed your reign of justice. May your healing saturate our city like the rain as we grieve these unnecessary violent deaths, shootings, displacements, and failures. Give our police, our mayor, our council, all who lead the vision of true leaders and the power of transformative justice. For we pray in the name of the one who spoke in language that will endure when time itself is meaningless and who taught us his prayer saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from it is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now consider all the ways that we love and give so that this community may flourish and before we get back to passing offering plates, which I hope we will do soon, I would just remind you that um, the basket is there at the back and you are also invited through all the technology at our fingertips now to remember our capital campaign and our needs to return much of what we receive to our community. So may we be blessed, that we may be a blessing.
A few announcements as we close our service. There is a set of keys that came to me that was discovered in the Belmont parking lot, which would be the front. Is that right, David? Um, okay. <laughs> I, I use the uh, the house parking lot. Anyway, please uh, come see me after our worship service if these might be yours. They could be someone else's entirely, but we'll see. Excuse me? So, uh, as you've seen in your bulletins, Martha Gillis is uh, moving to be with her family in Portland, Maine. I don't believe Martha has made it this morning. Is that right? She did tell me she was pretty sure she couldn't just this morning. But I do want to, uh, to call attention to some other folks who are also moving. We got a lot of transition going on. John and Annie McClure are here. And so I would love it if you all would... <laughs> Now, John, I'm going to totally embarrass you. I would, for, after our uh, our last hymn, we would love it. We would love it if you, the center up. Microphone. There you go. And bless you on your way. It's been years. Is that right? that you have been such integral, loving, wonderful members of this community. I'm so glad you're here. And I think that's it for my announcement. So just remember when we finish our hymn, John and Annie, if you could come right out here and we will something to socially distance safely, we'll figure it out. So I'm sort of envisioning this in my mind. Maybe if you could stand right here and we will all lift our hands in blessing 
Yes. And let us, let us pray together, friends. God, we give you thanks for the McClure family and for Joan, who has moved to be with other, other children of hers, adult children, for a time. We are so grateful for the presence of this family in our midst, for John's music, his preaching, his teaching of so many people, young and all ages, for Annie's care and, and uh, deliberate and disciplined keeping up with who needs your help, who needs our help, and who can receive the sacraments on days they are not here, and many, many things. We give you thanks for John and Annie. We, we pray knowing that their lives will be blessed and they will be such a blessing to the community of Louisville. So as we return them to their previous home, we ask for just joy and goodness to be with them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And all God's people said, amen. And friends, I would invite you to go out into the world. If you have plans today, maybe reconsider. <laughs> Nurture the rich soil that is you. May you become uh, an inviting place, a place of quiet beauty, a manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. Glow with all the greens and every red and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. And may the Lord look deep into your eyes and grant you peace. And may that peace which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds at rest in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>